So we're here to talk about uh, high-speed data processing with Geode, uh, Spring Cloud Dataflow, Spring Cloud Stream, uh, programming, mo prog programming model for Spring Cloud Dataflow. Uh, so we're going to go through a very brief uh, intro to who we are, and we're going to turn it over to Tiffany to go through some code snippets with you, show you where to download the demo to be able to spin it up in GCP or AWS or wherever you want to spin it up in, and then we're going to circle back uh, after that. So. To start off with, we're from a company called Infuse. Uh, we're a professional services company. We're not a product company. Uh, so we're brought into situations uh, where clients um, may have run into trouble with event-driven architecture, uh, maybe just starting out with event-driven architecture. Uh, they don't know what to do. They don't know how to plan. Um, they don't know where to start, really. They don't know what they don't know, right? Which is, which is all too often the case. Uh, so, Infuse is a little bit different than a normal app development company because we're very, very back-end oriented, right? Um, that kind of entails us knowing a lot of things, especially when we were working with massive amounts of data, right? So things like Spark, things like Hadoop, uh, not only being developers and working with uh, different spring starters, but also if those starters don't exist for those utilities yet, we create them internally. We implement them inside of our client pipelines. And we do some other fun stuff, which we'll get through uh, here pretty soon. So what I first want to start out with this talk, at least, is the differences between Spring Cloud Dataflow and Spring Cloud Stream. So lots of times we'll come onto a client and they've been sold on to uh, Spring Cloud Dataflow, right? Uh, and it's going to solve all of their streaming needs. They don't have to worry about any other technologies. All they have to do is drag and drop items on this canvas and they have a pipeline, right? Um, that's not... Uh, it, it's nice for development. It's nice for iterating different uh, development pipelines and things like that, but we're never going to do that in production, right? We're never going to make drag and drop modules that will uh, just deploy in a whim in production servers. Not only that, but Spring Cloud Dataflow offers a lot of uh, out of the box modules. You can change middleware and things like that very, very quickly. Whoops. Um, just like any kind of plugin, though, any kind of module. Um, it's going to do about 98% of what you want, right? But that other 2% you need that's not included is usually going to be paramount for whatever business use case uh, that you're trying to build your pipeline for. So in comes Spring Cloud Stream on top of that. Spring Cloud Stream is the programming model that we use to develop applications to deploy <clears throat> from Spring Cloud Dataflow. Spring Cloud Stream is very, very nice because uh, it's a unified programming model. And we can switch out binders very, very easily. So I'll give you one anecdote for a client last week uh, that we ran into an issue with. Uh, we were migrating cloud environments from AWS to GCP, right? So initially, uh, we had a middleware of a source application uh, listening from SQS queues, right? Not abnormal at all. So we switch out that middleware to uh, the GCP pub starter. We have a timeline. We can't really go in and do a lot of uh, manual redesign or refactoring with this source. Uh, and we noticed we were getting message duplication, right? Uh, the decision was made to move over to Kafka for that source instead. Uh, normally, uh, without something like Spring Cloud Stream, uh, it would be a major overhaul of an application to, to, to implement uh, Spring Kafka instead of a, a boot starter for a GCP pub sub. With Spring Cloud Stream and the binders, uh, literally, we replaced the binder, which is a, a Maven, uh, a Maven artifact, and uh, we change a couple application properties, and it's done. We switch to middleware completely, which avoided the problem we ran into entirely in about 20 minutes, right? Which is insane. That's kind of unheard of uh, before Spring Cloud Stream. So, with the rest of this talk, when we're going through code snippets, et cetera, uh, remember the programming model we're really focusing on is Spring Cloud Stream. Anything we create in Spring Cloud Stream, we can deploy through Spring Cloud Dataflow, which is an orchestrator, right? That said, uh, we're also talking a little bit about uh, Geode today, right? That's the important part. Uh, Geode, uh, when we're brought into a client, lots of times it's because they're blocked, right? You, you come in, their architecture is already built. They have all of these API endpoints that they want you to grab from to enrich data uh, along. They're, we're trying to break down those old COBOL ETL processes into more of a microservice pipeline-oriented, event-driven oriented architecture. And we run into bottlenecks everywhere, especially when a client says, you know, we have an AS400 that we need you to source data from. We have this 
you know, at this API endpoint that does you know single requests we need to source data from. But we also have an SLA of you know 100 million payloads a day, right? So um, going through all that, there always needs to be a come to Jesus moment with the client, right? Like that's just some of that that stuff's unachievable if you want us to use uh, you know legacy things within that system. Uh, yesterday there was a good talk, uh, a really good talk by someone from Southwest uh, saying, you know, how do you know if something is going to work? You know, try it, right? So, so that's really what what our talk is about. We tried it, right? We we uh, we're making things go fast. If you didn't come here for uh, the Geode talk yesterday, a uh, little bit of history about this. Geode uh, was open sourced in 2017. Uh, we've got Gemfire, Cloud Cache, which are all built off of open source Geode now. Uh, Gemfire is more of a standalone, right? And then uh, Pivotal Cloud Cache is really a, clash or a cache for your services inside of the Pivotal platform to attach, attach to different applications and things like that. So it's all based on Geode. Everything we're going to be saying is really, really based on Geode. Uh, is Geode right for your project? Uh, I would start off by saying anything, uh, anything else than, yeah, like it just is, you know? Uh, I mean, it's as easy as that for me. I mean, it can even get more base into that. I've come through different clients where there are no architecturally approved uh, caching services whatsoever, and they wanted pipelines with data enrichment and all these things and these huge payloads. Uh, if you don't have a cache in your architecture, you know, you've got to have some kind of dotted box in there that says, in the future, we're going to need this whether we want it or not. So uh, Geo does a lot of things. Uh, that normal caches don't. Uh, the great thing about Geode, at least uh, with our experience with it, coming from the big data world, dealing with Hadoop and Spark and high availability and multi-regions and all of that, is you get all that stuff with Geode, right? You get all that stuff with Gemfire, you get all that stuff with PCC. So that high availability can spread out across the entire country, which is really nice. So large, large data, large, large, large volumes of data. Uh, you can store a massive amount of data in Geode. When we're enriching data and our key set is, you know, 200 million objects to choose from, we need something huge, which could be scaled out. Um, it could become uh, double that within, you know, a quarter. Super, super high throughput, right? As pipeline developers developing these new uh, composed uh, microservice pipelines, it's super huge that we look for bottlenecks, right? And pulling from an API endpoint that gives you a single request is, is just going to kill it, right? Uh, we've, we've, I, don't, I, can't, I can't even begin to tell you how many services we've denial of service attacked with pipelines, right? Just by implementing the pipeline and making it fast. So choosing the right service, Geo is definitely the right service as far as data enrichment and caching. Uh, you can mitigate those right off the bat. And low latency, right? We need it fast. Uh, there's a number of other... Um, number of other reasons to use Geode, but uh, uh, we won't go through those. We'll start going through code snippets. So, Tiffany, do you want to go ahead? Thank you, Kaylin. Uh, well, welcome, everyone. So, I'm my name is Tiffany, and I'm from LA. Anyone else from LA here? Thank you, Michael. <laughs> Great. Uh, so, I flew into Austin, and the landing on the plane was a little rocky like some turbulence, planes kind of doing sudden drops. Um, and, you know, I'm usually not scared of flying, but sometimes when the plane is like that, when there's a lot of turbulence, I have these thoughts about death, right? Like, am I going to die today? <laughs> um, so I was thinking about like, oh, the people I love in my life, and like, I'm grateful for all the opportunities I've had. And, you know, it's like, great. Like, I hope I make it so I can do this talk at Austin. But I also had this other thought, which was, you know, if the plane goes down, it wouldn't be such a big problem if we were all like geode, right? Highly available and fall tolerant. Like, wouldn't that be amazing? <laughs> and so that's what I'm going to talk to you about uh, before going into code snippets, showing just how easy it is to integrate with a gem, uh, geode or gemfire cluster. Uh, and then we'll talk a little bit about a pipeline. All right, so horizontal scalability. Say, how many of you are developers here? All right, it's most of the room, awesome. Uh, so say you just want to try out Geode, right? You just want to spin up a POC, you just want to try it at home or on a pet project. 
Great, you can start with one lo locator, one server, no problem. What is a locator or a server? Uh, does anyone does anyone in the room know? There's the right talk. Uh, anyone want to shout out? Volunteer. What's a locator? What is it? Service that spreads the load to the server. Bingo! <laughs> a plus to the guy in the front. <laughs> so that's exactly right. So a locator performs some load balancing. Um, it is one of the members of the geode cluster that has a well-known address. So if you're a client application, you'll connect to a locator and you'll say, hey, I want to know, like, where can I find my data? Right? The locator will respond with all the addresses uh, for the servers where you can find your data. Great, so you've got the addresses of the servers, and now as a client application, what you can do is directly call the servers after that to get your data. So that means you have single hop capability, right? That helps cut down on the network time and the latency. Um, but of course, with one locator and one server, you don't have any fault tolerance, right? And so we recommend that you just spin up another locator and a couple other servers, no problem. Right, so if you want to spin up more servers, uh, just push a command, you can use gfish, uh, SSH into a loca locator and use gfish, and uh, some servers will get spun up, the locator will grab the address of the new servers and distribute it to the other members of the cluster. So everyone knows where everyone else is, all right. Now for high availability, we do recommend generally that you have at least three locators available. And as your project starts maturing and your performance requirements increase, you can just simply spin up more servers, right? Horizontally scale your data, your data store infrastructure. Um, and that's great because it's also independently scalable um, or it's scalable independent of your application uh, scaling as well. All right, so I mentioned that I'm from LA, and since I'm from LA, I'm always thinking about when the big one is going to happen. Right? <laughs> when is that large earthquake going to happen? We're always waiting for it. Um, so suppose that it finally arrives and California falls into the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> You're going to have a lot of trouble on your hands, but Getting data from your geode cluster is not going to be one of them. Um, and that's because you can spin up your geode clusters in whatever cloud availability zones you have. Um, and geode also is fault tolerant. So what do I mean by that? Um, so to talk about that, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the basic uh, terminology in geode. You have the idea of caches. And if you're coming from a relational world, you can kind of think of a cache as like a database. It's the thing that houses all of the uh, definitions for your data. Um, and in geode land, we have something called a region. Uh, so again, just like database, uh, databases are kind of like caches in geode, a region is kind of like a table in geode. So usually your tables will kind of represent some kind of domain object. Um, and we get fault tolerant, tolerance in that we can either replicate a region or we can have partitioned regions. So with region replication, uh, here on the diagram, I represent that with the products region. Uh, you have a full replica of your data set in each of your nodes or each of your caches. Um, with partitioned regions, what happens is you can split up your data. So usually you want to do a partition region if you've got a really large data set. Um, whereas if you've got a relatively small data set, uh, such as products, if you're an e-commerce store, uh, then you know go to town. Go, go ahead and replicate your regions. Um, so back to partitioned regions. Here you can see we have orders A, B, and C. And those kind of represent splitting up your data set into three different um, partitions. And uh, what Geode will do is it will create uh, backup copies of your primary partition region. So for example, for orders A and cache one, you can see we have backups in cache two and cache three. 
and so on for orders B and C. Um, if, if, for example, orders have IDs that are like se sequential, then that's a really natural fit for making orders a partitioned region. So a lot of you guys here are developers and you're probably thinking like, oh, how do I, great, Geo sounds like it's perfect for me. How do I use it? Has anyone used Spring Boot before? All right, almost the entire room, awesome. So in typical Spring Boot fashion, uh, you have a, a ton of really wonderful annotations that give you out of the box magic, right? Um, so here we have our familiar Spring Boot application annotation. Uh, this is our main application class. And we just slap on a client cache application annotation. And what this does is this will say, okay, this Spring Boot application is a client, uh, client application that talks to uh, a geode cluster. There are other uh, annotations available as well. So I'm pulling in that, this annotation from the Spring uh, Geode Starter. Uh, so for example, if you wanted to create, uh, you can add a peer cache application annotation and that creates an application that's uh, a member of the, a peer member of the Geode cluster. You can create a, clash, uh, a server cache application. So that's, you know, peer, peer cache. Uh, on top of that, uh, this is a data serving member of the cluster that clients can talk to. But for the most part, most of your use cases are you're trying to create a client application that's talking to a uh, Jumpfire cluster, and so you'll use this annotation. Next stop, we have our repository. Right, um, has anyone used a Spring Data Library before? Yeah, a lot of you. If you've used Spring Boot, you probably use Spring Data. Um, and so a lot of this will look familiar. You can just declare a repository. It extends Gemfire repository. And here you can give it the type uh, of the domain class that you want, to, um, you want to use. And at the bottom here, we can see I've omitted the rest of this POJO for simplicity, but you can see we just have a POJO. It's called telemetry. And we've got the ID, ID is a vehicle ID. We have other fields like latitude and longitude, and we give it a region annotation. So this will represent the data that's residing in Geode. Next, we have some configuration. So here, uh, the first annotation, enable entity defined regions. Uh, this is a fun one. <laughs> so as a developer, when I'm in the dev environment, sometimes I like to create a lot of craft. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, so what this does is it will automatically spin, uh, create a region in your Gemfire cluster if that region doesn't already exist. So for when your application first boots up, says, ah, I've got this telemetry region. I don't know about this telemetry region yet. Like, there's no telemetry region in Geode, uh, but I can go ahead and create it, right? So one thing to keep in mind is you might want to be a little bit careful about this, using this annotation. Um, on the one hand, it's really nice because you don't have to use Gfish to create the regions in all of your Gemfire clusters. This will just happen automatically for you. But on the other hand, if you're like playing around in dev, you can create a lot of crop. And so just remember to clean up after that. Um, the second annotation is a kind of comp comes uh, with the first one. So you have to include Gemfire repositories annotation if you want to enable entity defined regions. Uh, and the third annotation, this one's really interesting. Uh, so this enables PDX serialization and deserialization. Um, so PDX is the serialization protocol uh, that it's highly performant and efficient. You could use Java serialization, Geode supports that out of the box, but it's not recommended, it's a little slow, it doesn't perform as well. The nice thing about PDX is, uh, which stands for port Portable Data Exchange Format, is that it's language agnostic. So on the server side, 
if you're writing a Java client or if you're writing like a C++ client or what have you, um, doesn't matter. You can write your geode functions in whatever language um, and they can all use the PDX uh, serialization protocol. Uh, some other features of PDX are that it uh, contains sufficient metadata uh, to enable server-side indexing and querying without having to do full object deserialization, right? So if your query only cares about a certain field, it'll just do that partial, partial deserialization. Uh, makes it very efficient. So here in our configuration class, we have a bean that allows us to um, connect to our locators. And that's about it. Like, that's all you really need to connect to Geode. All right, so what we have, uh, which is available on GitHub, I'll also be showing a link to it, is a sample data pipeline. This is pretty simple, uh, but the general architecture represents what many of you may be building right now if you're building a data pipeline, right? At one end of the pipeline, you have a source. Uh, this could be something like a database. Uh, and then maybe you have a use case where you want to enrich that data. And that data has to be enriched pretty fast, right? At the end of, other end of the pipeline, you have a sync. So this could be another database. Um, and in the middle, you have some kind of messaging middleware Right, this could be Kafka, this could be Kinesis, um, Google PubSub, RabbitMQ, what have you. Um, here in our example, we're using Kafka, and we kind of just to spin up a simple pipeline, use a lot of uh, out of the box features from Spring Cloud Stream. We actually grabbed a Spring Cloud Stream app. Uh, they have some apps that are just kind of available for you to play around with. And we grabbed a file source uh, app. So that's our source. Uh, and what we do is we drop a file into the file source. It starts reading that file line by line and pre publishing those lines into a Kafka topic. Um, our processor then reads each of these lines. It's using Spring Cloud Stream to automatically uh, stream in these messages. And then it does a lookup in Geo to do a really fast lookup, enrich that data, and then publish it to a Kafka topic. And at the end, in our demo pipeline, the sync is just a log app. Uh, but you, know, you get the picture. Um, it could be easily a database or whatever. And then we also have uh, metrics being taken client side with Prometheus, Micrometer. And that's all being uh, visually displayed with Grafana. All right, so this is the stuff that I'm personally very excited about. Not just are not are we not only are we talking to Geode, we're also using Spring Cloud Stream, which is an amazing library. If you haven't used it yet, please check it out. Uh, so if you're building a data pipeline, uh, using Spring Cloud Stream gives you a lot of features out of the box, and it also includes really great testing support as well. But at the top, we have an enable binding annotation. And this stuff is just like magic sauce. <laughs> um, so as Kaylin was uh, mentioning before, say that you're using RabbitMQ, after a while you're like, oh, you know, we've reached a certain level where we think we need Kafka instead. Guess what? You can switch over from RabbitMQ to Kafka without changing any of this code, right? This abstracts the actual middleware technology that you're using. All right, so we have our stream handler down there. Um, it's these annotations stream listener and send to are part of the Spring, Spring Cloud Stream library. Uh, it's doing some automatic uh, deserialization and then marshalling into our domain object. Uh, we do a telemetry rep repository find by ID that's grabbing some lookup data from Geode, enriching that incoming message and then producing that to a Kafka topic. All right, so if you want to play around with this repo, I encourage you, please check it out at infuse, github slash infuse slash geodemo. You can clone that repo down 
And it's set up using Minikube, so it's set up to run on pretty much any Kubernetes cluster. You can run it on any cloud provider of your choosing. Uh, it's using Spring Boot, of course, Gradle, Spring Cloud Stream, and Spring Geode Starter. All right, so these are some sample metrics that we took uh, running that pipeline in uh, Google, Google, Google Kubernetes engine. Um, I want to draw your attention not to the actual numbers on the very right-hand side. Uh, those, don't, those don't matter quite as much as seeing that if you want to process a million records in a certain amount of time, all you have to do is scale out your geode cluster, right? So with uh, one locator, three servers, um, and keep in mind this is sort of getting metrics on our whole geode working within our pipeline, and so we're also looking at, we're also using default settings for um, streaming the uh, top messages from our Kafka topics. Uh, with one Kafka top topic, one partition, et cetera, we're ingesting uh, a million records within 15 minutes, uh, but if you just scale that out, you can get it close to one minute, right? And the second thing I wanna draw your attention to is when we swapped out Geode for Postgres in our pipeline, it took at least four times as long to process that same data, right? So Geode in memory, a lot faster than if you're trying to, you know, grab from disk or SSC. All right, and these are, um, if it, just to clarify, if it wasn't clear, these are client-side metrics. If you want to go more in depth into server-side metrics, there was a really awesome talk yesterday by Helena Bates. Uh, it's part of Geode Summit, go check it out. It's called uh, uh, Geode in Performance. And over to you, Kaylin. Can you hear me? Cool. So at this point, Tiffany has sold you. She's sold your teams. Everybody's going to get rid of everything they have. Implement Spring Cloud Stream for everything, right? You're going to be using Kafka. Uh, you're going to be using Geode, all of that stuff. And uh, <clears throat> instead of a, a simple kind of linear pipeline, we, we turn into a real kind of use case, right? The real world is never as simple as a... Uh, uh, a two upper, a two lower, and a log sync, unfortunately, right? Um, so example scenario, uh, we have a source, a couple sinks, some crazy routing, a bunch of processors. Everything's calling from Geode, right? Um, I, as a technical product manager, right, have to accept these stories. I have a team working on this processor. I have a team working on that processor. Everybody's working on everything in parallel. They're all doing their unit tests, everything. Uh, they're, they're local sort of integration tests, but as a technical product manager, in order to show business value, uh, the only view I have in this data is the data I push into this pipeline and the data that comes out the two sinks, right? What happens to the data in between? What's the visibility of the data in between? Where, where are we pulling from? George here, who developed the middle processor, did he even have the right credentials to pull from that Genfire region, right? Nobody knows. There's no visibility into this. Uh, fortunately, we were able to talk a little bit last year about a thing we called continuous uh, data governance. Right? We've been partnering with a company called Data Drift that's still in, in stealth mode. Um, but they've been improving over time. And I wanted to go back to the code snippet that we just saw. And there is a code snippet in here that may have, Tiffany didn't talk about, right? It's the at Data Drift snippet, right? It doesn't really affect Anything that you do in your code, you as a team member are just required to put your code in there. It supports fan in, fan out, any kind of metadata you want to roll along with. It's automatically going to track data in and out of that processor, or that transformation, that source, or that sync. It's going to collect it, visualize it. Uh, these guys have done a great job of scaling out their back end. Uh, so it's not a bottleneck in any of these pipelines for the developer experience. It doesn't hamper you down at all. Uh, it's very, very quick. So when we get to some situation like this, um, Infuse was really interested in this partnership and working with this, uh, this data drift thing. 
uh, because it's super nice to debug our pipelines. We work exclusively in Spring Cloud Stream. And we've, we've, we've done you know, Lightbend, we've done Google, Google Dataflow, we've done a, a bunch of different streaming platforms. We choose Spring Cloud Stream to work it. It's, uh, it's just too, e it, it's too easy, right? It's too easy. Uh, there's lots of Java developers, um, and it's very easy to, to get them to learn uh, Spring Cloud Stream programming paradigm. But in order to debug these pipelines, we need that visual nature. We need to know what's happening after here. If, if, my, if my back end is Kafka, if my middleware is Kafka, the only way I'm going to be able to see what data is actually being put into each topic in between of these modules, um, each one of these, these processors, is if I consume manually in a console. Even in Confluent uh, Control Center, you cannot yet visualize or, or pull pieces of data out of a topic just to inspect. So, so it makes it very, very difficult for story acceptance uh, uh, with only your, your base things. And people can go wild. Anytime, anytime there's a bit of data or a processor here that you implement on a team, uh, if it's pushing data into a topic that's not you know, Avro serialized with a schema registry or something like that, you have the possibility to infect downstream data. Right? So having that ability to visualize that data in between applications without having to do anything is very, very nice. So this is not good enough. Right? Uh, this is a very, simple, uh, a very simple UI they call data mesh. Again, they're still in stealth, so you know, don't judge them too much by looks right now. But uh, um, it's pretty amazing. The, any, just with that one annotation, it's taking all of the data into those processors, all the data, data out of those processors, putting them in a huge big backend uh, for you that you as a data governance team can see. You also have the ability now uh, to put up things like data firewalls. right? Um, if uh, GDPR or CCPA, if somebody opts in or somebody opts out, I don't necessarily want this piece of data being sunk to S3 by this, this processor, right? You have the ability to do that now. So this is kind of the missing link for us as a company to be able to sell Spring Cloud Stream more to different clients. Uh, going in uh, without the ability to be able to visualize and, and track this data lineage, uh, it can sometimes be a hard sell. So, uh, I did want to expose that in here. Uh, I think we're probably out of time. I can't see your hand, but we're close to it. So uh, I get a lot of questions about Infuse and how we're different uh, than other app dev companies. We deal exclusively with data, right? From data DNFs to everything else. Uh, if we have to do a, a front end or a UI, we usually make a phone call and call somebody and they come in, right? Um, but we, 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 we're exclusively uh, back end. We, we have a good combination of labs trained developers, uh, and then we couple that with big data technologies from big data engineers. So we get that nice crossover section. And typically it's from one to the other, back and forth. Uh, it's, not a, a, it's not an easy training process, right? Uh, technical product managers run each one of our teams. Uh, we offer communication and transparency uh, throughout the entire process and team building enablement. We have a bunch of people that I don't necessarily want to let go <laughs> to work on clients full time because uh, they're too valuable, but we certainly build and enable client teams to build up your own team and continuous knowledge transfers throughout that process. Here's some of the technologies and expertise we provide. Uh, of course, Spring is number one. Uh, we love everything involved with Spring, uh, but again, we work with all these technologies in the back end to enable these pipelines, right? And that's that's. That's just the most popular ones. Uh, typically, uh, uh, there's a bunch of external services within pipelines that we have to deal with. So uh, stay connected. Uh, this is our website. This is, the again, the, the, the demo repository. We have some other cool uh, repositories that you guys can clone uh, from there. Uh, we have a, uh, a Medium site, too, that we post blogs onto very, very regularly, uh, all dealing with data pipelining, uh, things like that. So. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, questions, if there's any time? Uh, no time. I'll talk to you after we're done then. <laughs>